Welcome, it's Professor Bedrero, and today we're gonna to talk about risk homeostasis theory, RHT, sometimes referred to as risk compensation theory. And let me give you a brief overview. Um, the theory states that people adjust their behavior based on perceived levels of risk. So people have an ideal or target level of risk, and if they feel safer than their target level of risk, they will engage in more aggressive behavior, thereby increasing the risk until they hit their target level of risk. If people feel less safe than their target level of risk, they will modify their behavior to be more careful, thereby lowering the risk to reach their target level. There are four main factors that influence the behavior in the face of risk. First, expected benefits of risky behavior, such as um, getting to your destination sooner when speeding. The expected costs of cautious behavior, such as time lost by driving at a slower speed. The expected benefits of cautious behavior, such as fewer accidents or tickets when you drive slower. And the expected costs of risky behavior, more tickets and more accidents from speeding. So there's a debate out there whether risk homeostasis theory is valid or not, and that's what we're going to focus on in today's activity, and it'll be your fear journal due for this weekend. So we'll examine arguments both for and against risk homeostasis theory in the context of motor vehicle travel. We'll look at some available data for motor vehicles. And then your group assignment, your fear journal for this week, will be to pick an activity other than driving, because we'll be talking about that together here. Discuss briefly arguments for both sides that risk homeostasis theory is valid or not and then find data to help you make the decision on whether you believe risk homeostasis theory is valid for that activity or not. And I'm gonna tell you that my uh, scooter helmet is gray. Okay, so let's start with the argument in favor of risk homeostasis theory. First off, we need to realize that the only way to have zero risk of getting in an accident is to never be in a car or motor vehicle. But for most people, this is um, way too um, extreme. Complete avoidance of vehicles is just too extreme. That's not um, realistic. And since no risk is not an option, people will behave in ways that will um, move their risk to their ideal or target level. For example, when weather is good, people tend to drive faster than they should. And in rain and snow, people tend to slow down. Okay. And a com major component of risk homeostasis theory is that when we make cars safer by installing features such as seat belts, airbags, anti-lock brakes, collision avoidance, etc., people feel safer so that they engage in riskier behaviors, such as speeding, following too closely, uh, distracted driving, drowsy driving, etc. Even though the cars are safer, the overall accident rate and death rates stay relatively stable because the drivers are more aggressive or inattentive because they feel safer because of those features. The Hallmark example used to um, promote risk homeostasis theory was in 1967 when Sweden switched from driving on the left side of the road to the right side of the road. Prior to the change, experts predicted a significant increase in accident and death rates because drivers were gonna be unfamiliar with driving on the opposite side of the road. However, right after the change of which side to drive on, accidents and deaths dropped significantly. However, within two years after the switch, the accident rates had returned to about the same levels as before the switch to on which side to drive on the road. Okay. Now, not everybody believes in risk homeostasis theory. Some people argue against it. Um, in the article, we saw two people um, that May, their major argument is people are very poor judges of probability and risk. And one of the hallmark examples is the large number of people who gamble or play the lottery because your chance of winning um, big, especially in the lottery, is so super small. There are some studies that um, were used to support risk homeostasis theory that were poorly designed or poorly done. Um, there are too many other factors that they cite in these studies that could have caused the decrease in deaths. Okay. And they um, tore apart the study by Peltzman 
because uh, he put pedestrians, motor vehicles, and automobiles all in the same category. He aggregated all the data. And when you do that, in this case, it skewed the results in favor of risk homeostasis theory. Uh, they argue that we should disaggregate the data, so we should look at motorcycles separately, automobiles separately, and pedestrians separately. That gives us a fairer um, view of uh, motor vehicle safety. Okay. There are even some studies out there that contradict risk homeostasis theory. For example, in Newfoundland, they created a seatbelt law, and just before they uh, passed it into existence, seatbelt usage was around 16%. After the law went into effect, seatbelt usage went up to 77% with very little change to other driving quality. So they cite this as a argument against risk homeostasis theory. People wore their seatbelt more, but they didn't increase um, their aggressiveness in their driving and as evidenced by um, the statistics showing that people drove about the same, they just wore their seatbelt more. Um, there's another study out there, um, this was of younger drivers in the U.S., that found that the act of putting on their seatbelt actually increased, not decreased, the driver's sense of precaution. So as, they were, as the youth were putting on their seatbelt, it reminded them that you know, they needed to be safer and drive more safely. Okay. And I'll tell you that my car is red. Okay. So what do you think? Based on the arguments or evidence so far, do you think risk homeostasis theory is valid or not for motor vehicle travel? I'll let you think about that for a few seconds here. It's always good to see both sides of the story um, before you make your decision. So let's actually look at some data. I uh, found some data at uh, the utah.gov where they have tracked the traffic deaths in uh, Utah from uh, 2009 through 2018. And you can see in this first row here that the total number of fatalities in the state has remained fairly constant. Now you'll notice that um, collision avoidance uh, features became more standard on cars around the 2013, 2014 era, but you'll notice that the total number of fatalities in the state has stayed fairly constant. There's been some fluctuation, but overall it stayed fairly constant. So um, what do you think? Do you think that, well, let me go back, do you think that that means that um, since the cars got safer, people drive more aggressively uh, with those added features, or they are um, <clears throat> more likely to drive distracted or drowsy, or do you think that um, the argument for the other side, argument for the other side um, is that the um, safety features are there, they are making people more safe, but there are other factors at play that are causing the um, basic maintenance of the level of traffic fatalities. Okay, so now it's your turn. Your um, assignment as a group, this will be take the place of your fear journal for this week, is to do some research and then write a two to three page well -wit written report. It'll be due April 5th. So please follow these steps. First, pick an activity other than driving. We've discussed that one extensively. Number two, for each argument for or against, I want you to give me two to three paragraphs of whether that activity um, risk homeostasis theory is valid and is not valid. Then go and find some data. I want you to give me the data and or the source and then use that data to make your decision on whether risk homeostasis theory is valid for that activity or not. And finally, make your decision and use the data to support your claim. So we'll see you next video.